In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. You know, I have never given a proper full sermon on divorce and adultery. And I won't today either. You know, I saw, I wanted to kind of like see who squirmed. No, it's all right. We're going to talk about children instead. That's so much better. Today, as we pivot into October, we're about halfway through our gifted sermon series. And this sermon series and the series we've been doing in our podcast during the week have all been centered on this idea of giftedness. We are endowed with gifts, and then we are called to use those gifts in the world. And you've hit, heard us ring that bell over and over and over again for weeks. Today, we actually pivot from that sort of discovery of gifts and the use in time and talent to actually that use of gifts in treasure. Everything is necessary. As we give, we wish to give more. As we give more of our time, we want to give of our talents and treasure. As we give more of our treasure, we want to give more of our time and our talents. And it's this wonderful, virtuous cycle that takes us up and up and up. Today, we really pivot toward that treasure idea, that idea of generosity. And it is anchored right here in today's gospel lesson. In today's lesson, Jesus says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Now, when I start thinking of children, I think of going to visit our kids at the St. Michael Episcopal School. I go over to the St. Michael School regularly, and over the last few months, I've actually gone to read stories to the kindergartners, and I love reading stories. And the first time I went, they were so excited to tell me all about what each other was doing. And I thought that was delightful. They all had a fun story about what good things everyone else in the school, in the classroom had done. And then after telling me all about that, we went to sit down on the floor so we could read the book. And they were so sweet to each other, finding space for each other. They wanted to make sure everybody had a space on the carpet and could see the book. And then as I started reading the book, I tend to pick books that encourage yelling or cheering of some kind because, of course, and the book I had picked that day, if you've not read Stop That Pickle, I highly encourage you to do so. A pickle jumps out of a jar in a cafe and then runs down the street and everyone has to chase the pickle. And at the end of every page, what do you have to yell? Stop that pickle, of course. And so watching the children encourage each other to yell and like really get into it, right? And don't just say stop that pickle, but yell stop that pickle. It was wonderful to watch them love each other so much. That generosity, that desire to be in community, that, that hope that you see in young children is really how we are made to be. I think of them when I think of what Jesus says here. To receive the kingdom of God as a little child necessarily begs the question, how would a little child receive the kingdom? And I think we can all imagine the generosity that children show naturally to one another, desiring to share and uplift and encourage. I think children receive God's kingdom with that incredibly generous spirit. And today we're invited to think back on when we had that same unabashed, shameless kind of generosity in our own spirit. See, I think we're made to be generous. We are made to give of ourselves. If I were to ask you, what makes someone happy? We often think about achievements getting things that we want, working hard and consuming things. And yes, getting stuff and reaching goals and reaching achievements is something that will make us happy for a moment. It will change our mood. But when we talk about happiness as that deep joy, that anchor, that rootedness of joy that we can find in God, that joy that God gives to us, that we can then reflect to others, actually, being generous is what makes us truly happy. And don't take my word for it. There's lots of research that goes to back this up. A recent study of tens of thousands of people in North America showed that happiness is gained most when we give and give generously. In fact, you would need more than twice your income to actually impact 
the happiness that being generous in the community gives to people. And that is true in every single income bracket. The stuff that the world tells us is very important makes us feel good for a moment. But when we get in touch with our generosity, with our power to give to others, that's the kind of happiness, that's the kind of joy that is not just momentary, but sustaining deep and rich. And then here's the trick. It's not just about giving. It's actually about how we give. So let's talk about how we give for a moment. Think about the past, our human condition. In the past, we used to live in small little community groups. We were not globalized. We knew everybody. And when somebody needed help, we helped the person and we knew them and we saw the impact of our help. That is totally different than entering our credit card on a website. We are made to actually know the people in need, to help them when they are in need, to give generously, and then to see the impact of our gift. That's why in this research, there are actually three ingredients for that good, joyful feeling about giving. The first is that connection piece. We're made to know one another, to experience one another, all the good and the bad. And it is in that knowing that we see piece number two, which is the impact of our giving. Seeing the impact of when we give is critical for us to be reinforced in that joy of generosity. And finally, we need the choice, the choice to give, because if giving is ever coerced, it loses its joy. The generosity that we are called to around our own gifts is not something that is simply a good idea. It actually gets at the heart of how we were made, of who we were made to be. This idea of happiness and joy. Happiness isn't permanent. Nobody gets happy and stays happy permanently. Happiness takes effort. It takes constant attention. We need to regularly engage with ourselves, look at the way we live, how we are generous, how we use our gifts, because just because we made a good decision years ago doesn't mean that that decision has constantly impacted the joy that we experience. We all know, in perhaps a more real way than ever, how important it is to be together. Two years ago, we could have preached this interesting theoretical sermon about the pain of being separated. Now we know, we know very truly that being divided and separated, quarantined, feels bad. We so desire the connection, but being together isn't good enough. And being together means a lot. I have been told every week for weeks now, by people who come and share on Sunday mornings and throughout the week how great it is to finally be, be back together in person again. Yes, and it's not enough. That's that momentary feel good. But to really get that deep joy, that transformative joy that sustains us for days and weeks and years, a lifetime, we're talking about generosity. If you think about the way the church played a role throughout this entire pandemic, maintaining connection, continuing to inspire and encourage, actually going out and meeting needs of people with generosity, people we know, I think we can all say we see the capacity. We see the potential. We can feel the purposeful nature of the work that we do here in this place. And so today, you knew it's coming. Today, we are being invited to use our gifts with more energy, with more purpose, with a higher level of generosity and vision for actually leaning into and being transformed more and more into the people God has made us to be. What you will receive this week in your homes is a packet of information that explains just how much our generosity together is impacting not only this community, but the world outside these walls. And the invitation, the ask, 
is that you give and give more. And in that giving, reach much deeper down into your spirit to connect yourself to that childlike generosity that we began with and have sort of lost some along the way. Here together in this community, we can actually reinforce one another, encourage one another to be more the people that God made us to be. And by the way, it will feel good. It will feel good even beginning today because I have a little fun thing for you. Out in the hallway, we are engaging particularly our children and the young at heart with a fun little scavenger hunt for Jesus. So, have you ever played a scavenger hunt for Jesus? I haven't yet, I'm going to today. Every Sunday in October, we are going to place, I might say hide, but he's not that hidden, hide a Jesus doll, literally six foot tall Jesus doll, it's impressive, somewhere on the campus of the church, and you and your young friends are invited to go hunt for Jesus. And when you do, you'll discover up areas of the church you may not know, and with each of those areas of the church all this month, we will highlight one of the spiritual gifts that we are called to use together in this community. It's a little fun and a little spirit to help encourage each of us in our own shift toward generosity. Now, I've invited you into something important. Many of you here have made the leap and some have not. You are not alone. For those of you who may be considering a gift for the first time, for those of you who might actually know very honestly your gift is not quite the kind of generosity that you could give, know you're not alone. All of us can be stretched. All of us can be challenged. All of us can lean into the invitation God makes to us to find that deeper joy. We are all given gifts. We are all made to generously use those gifts. And so I'm asking you to go beyond nice and to reach for that generous. And when we do together, not only will we be able to do more and more in the world, but you will find that deep, true well of joy that will sustain you forever. Amen.